What's going on guys, Balkan Arctic here and in today's video I'm going to be answering some of the common questions that they get in regards to Revit. So I get a lot of comments, I get a lot of email, I get a lot of questions of people asking me best number of topics, best number of questions, but there are some questions that do pop up quite uh, uh, quite often, so I thought why not create a video where I just answer all of those uh, questions uh, when it comes to working in Revit. These are not going to be uh, questions where I answer it through a tutorial, through a video of showing you anything in Revit. I'm just answering this perhaps, let's say, in theory, uh, just to explain why does Revit does, why does Revit do some things the way that it does. Uh, so that's what this video is going to be all about. Uh, now before I get started with that, I would just like to ask you to subscribe uh, because I upload useful Revit tutorials each week. And also make sure to like this video. It helps me out a lot with the YouTube algorithm and it helps promote the video to other people that might want to see it. And finally, uh, make sure to check out my website, balkanarctic.com. That's going to be the first link just below the video in the description. Uh, there I upload all of my Revit courses. I've got uh, like a hundred hours of content there. Uh, that's literally a hundred hours of content. I take the extra time to go in depth to uh, uh, and just explore in depth all of the complex Revit topics uh, and ranging from beginner into intermediate to advanced level topics. So everything is covered there. So if you're interested in some more, more long form specialized content, make sure to check it out. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's get into the questions. And the first question that I get is, why is everything a workaround in Revit? So what does that mean? Well, a workaround would mean that you're doing uh, or using a tool in a way that it wasn't uh, meant to be used, let's say. So hacking, I guess, would be another term for that. Uh, well, uh, in Revit, a lot of things are done this way. A lot of things are done as a workaround. For example, if you want to model a fence that follows your topography, you would model that as railing. You wouldn't model it as a fence because there's no fence, family, or tool in Revit. Uh, now, some people get annoyed either at uh, Autodesk for creating a software that doesn't have all of the capabilities that they would like to see, and other people get mad at me because I use workarounds in Revit. Uh, now, uh, for both of these uh, complaints, uh, I must say that the reason for this is either there just isn't a, w a way or a tool for a certain topic uh, in Revit. So, for example, fence is one of those. You just cannot model a fence. You have to use some sort of a workaround for that. And uh, this is for a lot of different uh, topics and a lot of different building elements. For example, recently I uh, filmed, or just before this one, I filmed a tutorial on base and crown molding. You know, that thing, that little strip that goes uh, around the ceiling and around uh, the floor. Uh, well, there isn't a tool for this in Revit, so you can't really you can either not model it or use a different tool that wasn't meant to be used for that to achieve that purpose. So for a lot of things, uh, just Revit isn't a complete piece of software and it probably never will be because the building technologies will continue to develop and Revit will continue to develop and it will always be uh, a few decades late because you can't really make sure to gonna have everything as a tool. And just imagine if Revit did have tools for everything. You know how many tools you would have? It would be like hundreds of thousands of tools. Uh, it would be impossible to scroll through all of these tools just to find what you're looking for. So I think that even though it's definitely not perfect, I'm not saying that it's ideal to use workarounds, I think it's it can be really useful in some cases. And in some cases, even though there is a specialized tool or approach or a workflow for something, a workaround could be a good choice. So for example, uh, one of these is for modeling kitchens. Uh, when I start modeling a kitchen, I always start with a really thick wall, like a 60 centimeter thick wall, and I use that instead of modeling kitchen elements. And the reason for this is it's a lot easier for me to move that wall around and try different configurations, different options, then it, then it would be for me to create a specialized like family for each casework component and then place it all. It would take hours. And like this, it's just a few seconds, couple of clicks. I can test out different 
options and then I can delete that wall and place in correct elements. So in some cases, a workaround is just going to be a far better solution than going in and uh, using the, the, the correct tool for that. So even though it can be a little bit annoying, it's just the reality we have to live in and I don't think you should be uh, too worried about this. Make sure that everything kind of comes together when it comes to data and extracting everything into schedules and just assembling or all product documentation. So that is definitely something you should uh, keep in mind, but uh, you shouldn't stray away from workarounds or you shouldn't avoid them because in a lot of cases they are quite necessary. The second complaint or question that I get all the time is why can't I use an older version of Revit? Uh, for example, people when they join my Patreon page, they perhaps have Revit 2017 and then they find it quite annoying that they have to upgrade because all of my files are Revit 2019, Revit 2020 or 2021. Well, the reason for this is, uh, well, <laughs> one of the reasons is probably because Autodesk switched to a purely subscription-based uh, approach. So you cannot really buy Revit anymore. You can only subscribe uh, to Revit and then you have to pay each year or each month or each three years. I, I have a whole video on that. But anyways, uh, it's because Autodesk doesn't want you to buy like Revit 2020 and then use it for the next 10 years. They want you to get the newest version each time because then it's, I think it's a better business model, well, at least for them. Uh, but also new capabilities and new functions come each year. And uh, coming back to that first topic that we talked about, the workarounds, well, a lot of workarounds get worked out in new versions. So it's it's a good idea to update your version of Revit. I know it can be a very annoying, uh, but it is something that's a reality. And yes, I have a whole video, which I'm going to link there or there, I don't know, in the, the cards up there or in the link where I explained how to save files uh, in a way that you can open them in the uh, earlier versions of Revit. Uh, but as I mentioned in that video, it's not something that's ideal and it does present itself with a few problems. Uh, it's uh, You lose a lot of functionality and a lot of data, which is definitely not good. Now, the next question that I often get is, where can I find good Revit families? Well, this is something that's uh, quite common and I always say that your Revit projects are only going to be as good as the families that you use inside of them. The family is the building block of your Revit project, so to speak. So it's important to have good families. So this is a naturally good question. Uh, now, the problem is, well, it's really hard to define good families and it's really hard to define what exactly you're looking for. I think everybody's different and everybody's needs are different. Every project is different. Every company is different. Every individual is different. So everybody's going to have different requirements when it comes to families. Are you using them just to make projects look amazing or are you using them to keep a lot of data inside of them so you can optimize the whole building information modeling process? Why, wh what are all of the requirements for your family? So that's the first question that you should probably ask yourself. Try to define those things and then try to assemble your own libraries accordingly. So I suggest that everybody has their own little library of Revit families on hand. Uh, try to keep that on your computer at all times so you can use it. And there are a lot of different websites where you can find them. Revit City and BIM Object are probably the most popular ones. Uh, the families there, they're, I, I guess, a hit uh, and miss. Some are really good, some are terrible, and it's really, uh, it's, it's really, if you're lucky, uh, you're going to find what you're looking for, and in a lot of cases, you're not. So you can either use the best thing that you find or try to model it yourself. There are a lot of uh, different paid options, but usually these uh, are kind of according to the category of what you're looking for. So uh, maybe you're going to find a website with amazing plumbing families. 
that you can buy, but that's not really important to you if you don't care about plumbing. So it's really important to find what you're looking for. Now, uh, a website that I uh, work with from time to time, I'm going to leave a link to that in the description just below the video, and if you use that link, you can get uh, a few free families. They they make these amazing, super realistic families that look amazing in renderings. So if that's something that you're interested in, if uh, you're looking for families that enhance the aesthetic appearance of your models and make good renderings, well, uh, you can check that out if you're interested. And then there are, of course, loads of different websites for, websites for different uh, purposes and uh, different types of families. The next question is what other software, uh, modeling software uh, can I use or models modeled in different uh, modeling software can I use inside of Revit? So this is a common question because uh, a lot of users uh, in Revit start off in different software or you're working with people that are using a different program and you would like to collaborate with them and you're interested, well, can I load that model in, into Revit? Now, in, uh, in most cases, in my experience, the answer is yes, but. So, you can load in SketchUp models, you can load in uh, models from Rhino, you can mo uh, load in things from 3ds Max, you can load in things from AutoCAD. So, it's not a question of can it be done, yes, it can be done, the, the question is what will that model be like, how it will behave, and how functional will it be. So, again, uh, uh, if you're using those models just to enhance the look, well, in some cases it can, you can find models that look really good. Now, the problem is, uh, in a lot of cases, the behavior of those models and the functionality and the parameters is usually going to be well off. E even the material, uh, the approach to materials and just the appearance can be quite terrible. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, it's really difficult to get it to work just right, but it can be done. Uh, I know that people can integrate Rhino and Revit and, and things like that and it can be, work quite amazing, uh, but it is uh, a bit of a process. Yes, it can work, uh, but be prepared to do your research and uh, be prepared for a little trial and error before you get it to do exactly what you want it to do. And finally, uh, by far, one of the most <laughs> common questions that I get is I cannot see X inside of my floor plan, 3D view, elevation, whatever. So in a lot of cases, people model something in Revit and then they cannot see that. So it's not visible in view for whatever reason. Uh, now, this is quite common and in most cases, it's a question of the visibility settings. So when you're inside of your view in the properties panel, you get the view properties and try playing around with the visibility graphics. Uh, visibility graphics overrides sometimes uh, certain categories are just simply turned off. So when you turn them on, you will be able to see that element. In other cases, it might be due to view range. It might be uh, below or above uh, what you're set up to see. So it might be into the uh, in, inside of the view range settings. Again, it's in the view properties, or it can be uh, another <laughs> set of reasons. It might be hidden uh, or something like that. So it could be a wide uh, variety of reasons. And I've actually created a video where I kind of troubleshoot a different, uh, a different possibilities of where could things be hidden and different approaches to finding things that are missing. So I'm just going to leave that again with the cards and also in the description I'm going to leave the link to that as well. So check out the entire video if you're interested in that. Okay, so that's it. I hope I have uh, shown you something interesting. I hope I have solved uh, some of your problems, answered some questions, or I hope the video was entertaining at least. If, if I didn't help you, I hope you at least had some mild form of fun watching this. Uh, please tell me in the comment section below what are some of the questions that you either have or that you see that people have and that you know the answer and you would just like to tell everybody. Uh, please tell me in the, in the comment section below the video. I'm interested to hear that. And tell me do you like these videos where I don't really work in Revit, where I just perhaps talk about, uh, in theory, some of the uh, Revit's uh, problems and issues 
and so on. So tell me if you're interested in that. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Again, make sure to check out my website, BalkanArchitect.com, just below the video, and I'll be back with another Balkan Arctic tutorial in a couple of days. Thank you for watching, and have a nice day.